Hi everybody, tonight we're going to talk about alchemy and Gnosticism and to help us do that we've got Monsignor Gordon Stratford, so stay tuned, you're not going to want to miss it. Hey everybody, Father Tony Sylvia here and joining me my co-host Jonathan Stewart. Hello Jonathan. Hello Father Sylvia. Uh, how are you doing? Good, how are you? Good, good. So we're going to talk about alchemy, huh? That's going to be... That's going to be an interesting topic. So uh, yeah, we to, have the uh, special guest. Yes, we have our special guest, Monsignor Jordan Stratford, who has uh, written a little bit about alchemy and and uh, has has some has some knowledge on the subject. So welcome, Monsignor. Thanks for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. It's uh, I've had none this in a couple of years, so it's good to be here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> time flies. <laughs> that's very true. So. Um, you know, let's let's start with just an overview of alchemy. Uh, what what was alchemy? Uh, what do people think it was? Uh, you know, give us kind of the thirty thousand foot view. Okay, nice tidy question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the thirty thousand feet from which we're we're talking about, from which you can see the curvature of the Earth. By <laughs> That's the way. right. Um, with your squished eyeballs. <laughs> Inside squished joke. Eyeballs. That's right. So uh, you priests, you, know, you just you get them going, and it's always <laughs> mid conversation when you start. Always. <laughs> so. Yeah, you know, what what it was and, and what it is really the same thing is um, a, a set of lenses through which to uh, ask questions about the universe and to frame some of those questions so that when you start getting some results from your experiments, you can start sorting them out and making sense of them. And it is certainly the precursor to modern chemistry. Most of the building blocks and most of the, the heavy lifting of what we now understand as chemistry were done by individuals who referred to themselves as alchemists who assumed that they were doing alchemy. Mm -hmm. So um, the, in, in the evolution of ideas and the evolution of material science, Alchemy was a really critical stepping stone by laying the foundations for a lot of these ideas. Um, but because the the worldview overall from the people that were doing this kind of work was uh, the the things that were happening on the material plane were a, a subset of of a bigger picture of a bigger whole, and that all these layers between uh, kind of this pedestrian phenomenology of, of the everyday world was relevant and connected to uh, a spiritual world, an intuitive world, a creative world, and uh, an imaginal world. And so there really wasn't a difference. There wasn't you know this uh, this walling off between spirituality and the physical sciences. So what um, a lot of the alchemists who have traditionally um, also been spiritual practitioners, um, sometimes full-time clergy, uh, what they're really doing is trying to look for the, the fingerprints of divinity in, in common experience, in the components of the everyday world by cracking it open and having a look and, and asking deeper questions about it, engaging in an ongoing dialogue with the phenomena that was at their fingertips and in their labs. Mm -hmm. And at that time there really wasn't, um, there wasn't a distinction between uh, the secular world and the, and the spiritual world as you, as, you met, as you mentioned. So the natural inclination of that time would be just to see the whole thing as, as one giant, uh, you know, one giant system and everything kind of fit within it. But the system itself for alchemists was was very kind of um, almost mechanical, right? Yeah, in, in a lot of ways, um, yeah, that's very true. And I, I, I think you can kind of look at it. Uh, it's, it's very easy to oversimplify and try to create the analogy where you're dissecting a frog to see where the soul is. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, certainly that the documentation that we have from these early practitioners, their world was much more nuanced than that. It was much more uh, complex. It was richer. Um, but there were certainly, to to their worldview, there'd be commonalities between uh, chemical interactions and the interactions of the individual with the universe. Mm -hmm. So, you know, not to uh, kind of blanket psychologize, but... Um, 
in a very real sense, they were looking for themselves under a microscope mm -hmm. or in a, in a beaker. They were trying to say, okay, this is happening when I when I take this rock and I pulverize it and I and I crush it up and I set fire to it. Something's going on in there. It's also going on in me. And you know, they were they were right. We're we're made of ex like the same stuff that you know, if you pick up a book uh, and there's carbon there and we got a whole lot of carbon and it's I think that's interesting that you know here it is ash wednesday and mm -hmm. we're all wandering around schmutzed and um we, we are made of the same stuff as this the, the goop in the lab and we are um uh, this uh the residue of stars and that's a very powerful gnostic idea that we are a spark of the infinite divine mm -hmm. that we are radiant beings that so we're literally emitters even though we have this material vessel that takes us from place to place to place that's not the entirety of our story and that we continue to tell this story um long after the the material vessel degrades and simply goes back into the because it doesn't disappear you know we we compost we are recycled in this uh sort of this beautiful ongoing conversation with the created world and you know, so there's this similarity. I'm just going to jump out and assume that all of your brilliant bajillions of viewers are thoroughly vested in, in Gnosticism and they're, they're, this is a well-traveled road for them. So you know, alchemy is really framing the world in to what I see. That's largely confirmation bias, I know. Please beat me up. But you know, I see it as a, as a very Gnostic relationship. So that here are the stars. Here are forces that are larger than us, that are that, that are older than us. But we are absolutely a part of them, and we are inseparable from them. And there is this uh, concert, this conversation that is this ongoing. And you know, now we find ourselves in this pedestrian world, embedded in these these little lumps of carbon and, and, and you know, the hydrogen, nitrogen, argon, a few things, but, you know, not a whole lot else. Yeah. Um, you know, there's organic chemistry is, you know, this and, and inorganic chemistry is, is, is that. So, you know, we're this little subset of a subset and um, which again is, is kind of an interesting metaphor for, um, you know, that we're not, we're not getting the whole picture from, from just our material goop. Um, but the material goop in itself is still holy and infinite. Um, but it doesn't tell the whole story. And what the, uh, what the early Gnostics were, were trying to do and what the early alchemists were trying to do was to really figure out the same way that you know, any five-year-old with a screwdriver and an alarm clock is like, what's going on in here? Mm -hmm. let's, let's start taking this apart and... Uh, let's have a look at you know what what's where does this tick and sound come from, and w where is the, the the impetus of movement, and you know why why is this happening? With, what's the nature of this this cyclical uh, uh, rhythm that I'm observing? And you, know, you crack open the case and you try to find you try to you get a little working theory retroactively. You're where it's a, a deconstructivist proposition where okay okay take the spring out and then it stops working you go okay well the spring is obviously doing something mm -hmm. what is that that's how i fix my computer that exactly yeah. you just take the take the springs out when it stops working that's the important thing you can't <laughs> lose that um but um you know so that's really the first step of the uh, of the alchemical trinity where you've got three phases mm -hmm. Um, and that's really the first phase. It's you know, like you take these things apart and you tr you try to understand them through deconstructing them. Mm -hmm. So let's take a step back here. Um, I think most people, when they think about alchemy, they um, they think about you know turning lead into gold. They think of uh, plant alchemy where you're creating elixirs, uh, you know, for for healing and things like that. Um, and uh, certainly alchemists were, do, were and are doing that kind of work and, and trying to do that kind of work. But um, what you're talking about, I think, and, and what I'm hearing anyway, is something more internal. So that the process, whatever you're doing in that, you know, to that plant is also happening to you. Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between those two processes? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've got um, a, a couple of the biggies that every 
alchemist is aiming towards and um you, you have uh crystal Pale, which is the the transmutation of lead into gold and you know, there they are tempting neighbors on the periodic table and you just you know you need to kind of flick them just one just you can get some bits off and and you, know, you move the thing over and lead into gold you know we know that it's possible you know, just to just bombard it with radiation very expensive proposition but mm -hmm. um you know w again that's that's part of, of taking things apart we look at the nature of the individual elements and the, by looking at the same as the individual aspects of ourselves. And if you take lead and say, okay, well, let's take two anything and let's compare, you know, how much do they weigh? Um, what, what properties are, how malleable are they? Um, what's their melting temperature? What, you know, what, what's their boiling temperature? Um, and uh, how conductive are they? How, how, what's their insulating factor? And when you start to see all these commonalities between lead um, and gold, and you say, these guys have a lot in common. And you know, at, at first and foremost, the fact that they're infinitely recoverable. Mm -hmm. And you know, this idea that literally they are um, a atomic. They, they, can't be, they can't be cut. It can't be diluted or turned into any other thing. You know, lead is lead, and that's it. So there are a whole lot of things in the alchemist's lab that can be reduced, and they can be reduced to, to a point. So you take things, uh, you take the whole universe apart, you take your whole lab apart, and eventually you get to um, special goop that can that is irreducible. Mm -hmm. And lead is irreducible. Gold is irreducible. Mercury, sulfur, you know, iron, irreducible. Carbon, irreducible. So you know, obviously these things are important because there's a sense that they're uh, these are the building blocks of the universe. And um, so you know, that's just there's just a, uh, there's a mechanic at work here. So when you're working in a um, uh, the haunted world of you know, what what um, Andrew Greeley referred to as the Catholic imagination, the fact that the divine is is imminent and at work, um, that you know obviously there is a it's not just a spiritual counterpoint, but there is a spiritual function to these things as well. So that's the lead into gold thing, and when you look, so we can start going from uh, these things which are not alive. Basically, we're grinding up rocks in the lab. Now you know. Let's grab something that's alive that isn't going to protest too much while we experiment on it. It's a lot easier to do to a plant than it is just to say, you know, a sheep um, or your neighbor. You know, it's, it can be no, it's a little noisier, messier, a little more high maintenance. But if you start to take a plant apart and you look at structures, and we're still working with this idea that that a, 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 a tomato plant is in some way haunted, in some way it's divine. There's a resonant ghost in the machine here. Mm -hmm. So what? Are the structures that we can dismantle and still identify this thing as a tomato plant? Mm -hmm. So this whole idea of of uh, irreducibility, reduction to, to irreducibility, and that's what plant alchemy spends a lot of time um, taking away structures and seeing what's left. And this idea that we can try to somehow capture the essence of that plant, and so it's you know become a liquid, it'll become an oil. So we you know the, the the system, literally the system, the stuff that is holding it up, we take away those those uh, that systemic nature, and we end up with an essence. We end up with an essential nature or an essential oil mm -hmm. um, that gives us the 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 true properties of the plant because it's because it's concentrated. So you know all, everything that we know about high school chemistry still applies in the alchemy lab, um, and at this point we start to because through this entire process we're taking copious notes because we want to learn something important, mm -hmm. and by running these experiments and by taking these notes we end up with something we have replicability in the lab, and we have concentrated doses of of plant essences that um, we can now apply. We've got dosage control is what we've stumbled upon. Mm -hmm. So now we have medicine. And so it's a medicine that's not just about healing the body, going from the physical to the physical, but also goes from the spiritual through the spiritual because these things are happening at the same time. They're not distinct. There's no, um, 
firewall of dualism between these experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, this is all happening at the same time. So, you know, that becomes, um, you know, even though they seem different, con like the different conversations, plant alchemy versus this idea of turning lead into gold, we're really talking about the pursuit of uh, reducibility, determining the point of irreducibility, and having replicability in the process of, of dismantling these things and finding their purest essence. So that's kind of step one, is take things apart to the point where you can't take them apart anymore. See what you what, see what you're looking at, and see what the differences are between the parts. Mm -hmm. um, and it, there are there are all of these these lovely complementary trinities in alchemical work, and so um, the the first is is the processes. Um, and the processes, of course, are, are rich in, in allegory, and we're using a lot of metaphor through all this as we're trying to understand it. Um, and we take things apart. That's the, that's the first bit, right? What, what, are, what are the components? What's inside the alarm clock? The second is we put it all back together. And you know, can we, in the lab, create something or recreate what's, what's occurring in nature? under a controlled environment where we can observe it and see what's really important. If we put the alarm clock back together without the spring, what, what happens? Okay. Um, and, and observe that. Is it ticking or is it not ticking? Does it run faster and slow? Whatever. We're just, we're just taking, um, uh, we're going to try to rebuild a plant from the compost goo that we made in taking the plant apart. And guess what? You actually can. Mm -hmm. We can, we can uh, introduce uh, genetic information in the form of a seed into that goo, which is extremely this nitrogen-rich, fertile goo, and we will get a new plant. Mm -hmm. um, and then we can watch that plant and, and, and learn from it. So the second is you can put it all together. But the third thing that we run into, and you kind of here's the biggie where it really has um, a, a really important and very healing message for us, is that everything wants to change. Everything in nature, uh, everything in the universe is in this constant state of desire for change. So it's not just changing, it wants to, it's hungry for it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so now we have this sort of holy trinity of processes, dismantling and putting things back together and then watching them change. So the if you light a candle and you see how that light um, how it rises with the heat. The light is trying to get somewhere. That there is this off-gassing of, of carbon. You put your hand over it, and you see a little black spot that, that appears in your hand. It's not the charring of your flesh. Um, but again, you know, there's this, uh, this, this conversation, this transaction that's taking place uh, that nature is really not fond of the static. So even when we have these irreducible chunks that we take things apart there. Once we put things all back together again, we've and we've initiated these uh, uh, various aspects, various cycles of change and transformation. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, here we are, spiritual beings wandering around in these, you know, fairly crude clay jugs of of uh, transportation, and we want to get better. We want to be different, um, and we all do. You know, mm -hmm. we're all curious as to what happens next. So the the infant wants to become the toddler, right? There are they got places to go. Um, the adolescent wants to become an adult, and you know, we want to to uh, we anticipate this next phase of our own maturation. We are yearning for it. We're pushing for it. We're bargaining for it, um, and. It seems that's what we're doing here. We're just trying to figure out what all of this means and how we can get better and, and how we can solve some problems and how we can, here's hoping that we can be a little nicer to each other in the process. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting how much, how badly we want that, how badly mm -hmm. everything in nature wants that. And alchemy honors that by letting us get a peek behind the curtain to say that we're, we're not alone and you know a plant wants to do this that the um the seed wishes to become the the stem the root 
that the bud wants to become the flower. The mm-hmm. flower becomes the fruit. Um, this is, you know, the, 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 the fruit wants to grow ripe and bear seed and become uh, a fertile ground for that seed and to inform the next aspect of, of that, the iteration of the plant, just as we have this um, fundamental universal desire to uh, grow and understand ourselves psychologically, intellectually, creatively, emotionally, spiritually. Um, that's just neat. <laughs> yeah, and that for me is the real, um, the real powerful metaphor of alchemy for, for Gnostics, that you know, that we do have this meat, you know, this, this physical part, but um, we share in common that divine spark with everything else, and that by this process of refining and, you know, the, the solve et coagula, kind of raising that that spark up. So that's that's really exciting. But I think we're going to talk a lot more about that in the podcast because we are out of time for the video show. So uh, everybody stay tuned for the podcast and, uh, you know, subscribe if you haven't already to that. But in the meantime, I'm on Senior Stratford. Thank you for doing this for us. Where would you like to send people to find out uh, all about you on the Internet? Um, Apostolic Johannite Church. I've been happy to uh, serve the church for uh, about 11 years now as clergy. Mm-hmm. And uh, coming up, yeah, 11 years. <laughs> wow. um, and um, the easiest way to find my alchemy book is it's just I wrote a, uh, a guide to this, the symbolic language of Western alchemy, the Western alchemical tradition. It's called, creatively enough, a, the Dictionary of Western Alchemy. Uh, it's available from Quest Books, so questbooks.com will will take you there. Very good, and uh, definitely check that out. It is a great resource to have on hand when, if you're interested in alchemy, you can check out a term that you uh, that you run across, and and uh, Monsignor Strabert has some really interesting insights in that book. So do check that out. Anyway. In, uh, as, uh, as I mentioned, we will be continuing this conversation in the podcast, so uh, stick around for that. And for everybody who is watching along at home, we will see you next week. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit patreon.com slash gnostic. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash g-n-o-s-t-i-c.